Bond actually went on the Colbert Report to announce the naming of Apostasis Stephen Colbert. Hi, I'm Tyler Fulce. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry, from engineering to operations to emergency response. I don't claim to know everything there is nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. Today we're going to be looking at another one of the hilarious Salmonella Academy's videos. This one is on where animals' scientific names... I was also told this is where he talks about the origin of the names of ionizing radiation units. Sounds intriguing. Let's take a look. Anyway, we all know about the scientific names of animals, but did you ever wonder what they actually mean? To find out, we must look to taxonomists. They're the guys responsible for the systems of nomenclature we use to classify organisms. And boy, are they convoluted. First, you got the big A. Domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. I've seen- That's interesting, because I've never heard of domain. Now, I've, it always just started with kingdom. Now, this is me in high school, so I may just be showing my age, but the main must be a new one. Plenty of mnemonic devices for this, but since the D just showed up in the 90s and is still disputed by some scientists, he's- the 90s? Okay, I take that back. I'm not that old. My high school just might not have taught me that. <laughs> Usually not included, so allow me to suggest a few. Dizzy kids puke cereal on fairground staff. Sure. Dump kittens pushing cups over feeds growing spite. Donkey Kong's <laughs> oh, fucking God. Serendipitously. Oh my, I was not ready for that one. <laughs> Is this the real reason why you wanted me to watch this when you wanted to see my reaction <laughs> to that bit of insanity? <laughs> I'm gonna need a moment. <laughs> Talking about Donkey Kong's Donkey Dong. <laughs> I loved Donkey Kong games as a kid. The way this whole thing works differs slightly depending on which kingdom you pick. So today we'll be sticking to the animal one, cause that one's the coolest and I'm in it. So what constitutes each taxon is pretty arbitrary, they basically just serve to act as another set of branches in the tree that taxonomists build. The one exception is species, which is generally defined as any group of animals that can have babies with each other that aren't sterile freaks. <laughs> Mule, Liger, Zedong, mm. Skunk Ape, they can live fulfilling lives, but they're all shooting blank so they don't count. On the other hand, in our innumerable trespasses against God, we can make things like Chidane Danes, which actually work, so dogs are dogs are dogs. Besides species, yeah. though, it's the Wild West in here. Plenty of times, eight tiers isn't even enough for scientists, so they just stick new sublevels in between. Legions, cohorts, tribes, series, divisions. I've never heard of any of those, but I'm not a, not a biologist. If you want to keep going, you can throw all kinds of prefixes. Giga, magna, parv, nano. <laughs> I know micro and nano are 10 to the minus 6 and 10 to the minus 9, but I that's about it. <laughs> on any of these for even more layers. There's even subspecies, which the more pedantic of you may think to yourselves that creating names for subspecies at all kind of undermines the single somewhat agreed upon definition in the whole tree. To that, my friends, taxonomists say, uh. <laughs> but while that's pretty complex, <laughs> yep. the actual names themselves are pretty easy to wrap your head around. Though taxonomists may hide behind their fancy Greek and Latin, the Vulgate is no substitute for wit. Now, I've scraped through the scientific names of a load of species, and most of them can be split into a few categories. The simplest ones are the animals that already have have names in Greek or Latin. It's a lion, I'm calling it Leo. Done. Tiger, it's a tigris. Cat, it's a caddis. Easy. Multi-word names can be translated the same way. For the golden eagle, we got Aquila Chrysaetos. Gold eagle eagle. They decided to be a show off and do eagle and Twice Greek. the amount of eagle to gold. And Latin, essentially the same though. But if a species is too specific or exotic for a one-to-one -one translation, that's when you gotta get a little creative. A lot of the time, inspiration comes from just giving the creature the old once-over and pointing out some <laughs> cool-looking body part. Generally, the more distinct of an identifying feature it is, the more likely it'll get in the name. For example, Homeboy took one look at this thing and said, yup, red triangle slug, I'm going on break. We call this thing a fucking unicorn, almost like that means one <laughs> horn or something. Also, some guy deadass looked at an octopus and said, well, all the- did he just say dead ass? I don't even know why. Got his heads and feet. I'ma call him head foot. Now biologists everywhere say cephalopod unironically. Matter of fact, if it's got feet, chances are that's part of its name somewhere. You got four feet, six feet, eight feet, ten feet, two feet, equal feet, both feet, double like feet, that. stomach feet, lip feet, sucker feet, wing feet, big feet, slow feet, or feet, both feet, joint feet, no feet, ten thousand feet, cows feet, spade feet, cat feet, small feet. If it doesn't look that interesting, another thing that to point so out good. is where you found it. This could be a territory like American bear or Siamese crocodile, or just 
just a habitat like woods macaque or toilet rat. <laughs> but that's boring. We need to look at the men behind the magic and what drives and motivates them. Now, if there's one thing that the scientific community loves, it's clout. And there's no better yep. way to go down in history yep. than plastering your own name on some shit you found. But not all fields have the same volume of things to scribble the old John Hancock over. On the one end, you got physicists just making up their own slightly different form. Yes, that is how it works. <laughs> Still a bit deeper on radiation units. First one is activity. Think of it as disintegrations per second, which is what one becquerel is. That's the most commonly used unit. A curie is a massive unit of 37 billion becquerels. Now, I don't know if that's a reflection on her contributions to the community of physics compared to becquerel, but that's just very interesting. Another unit is the Rutherford, which I've never actually used before. It must be a pretty old one. One million becquerels. Nice round number, but like I said, never seen it used. Then over to exposure, and when you think of exposure, you're thinking of actual ionizations caused by the ionizing radiation. So the SI unit for that is coulombs, which is a unit of charge, divided by kilograms, which is a unit of mass. Makes sense when looking at, you know, a specific amount of ionizations. A Rodkin, which you've probably seen from HBO's Chernobyl series, is smaller than that. 2.58 times 10 to the minus 4th. Now on to absorb dose. Think of what a target physically absorbs, whether it's a person, an animal, or just a surface material. One red is the basic unit, and then you have gray, who was 100 reds. Red's a pretty big unit. And then on to dose equivalent. That is absorb dose multiplied by a quality factor. And we hear the basic unit is rem. Depending on what the radiation is, depends on what the dose equivalent is compared to just absorbed dose. For gamma radiation, one red is one rem. It's that simple. For alpha particles, though, one red is 20 rem. And the physicist here is Sievert, which is 100 rem. So these are big units. A thousand rems is a fatal dose. Even less than that is often a fatal dose or just 10 sieverts. Most commonly unit I've seen in terms of this was either in rem, millirem, or micro sieverts. So these are pretty big units. Of ionizing radiation measurement. And even then, only the top dogs got away with it. Now, zoology, any little goober flouncing through the underbrush can say, this one has 13 spots, but the one in the book's only got 11. I will call him Splinkus's Ladybird. Alternatively, plenty of biologists have given shout outs to their contemporaries, both other biologists and those across the academic gamut, from geologists to physicists to explorers and more. Naturally, Darwin's That's got so a shitload, but even the background characters get immortalized one way or another. Who are Thompson, Grant, Summer, Summering Erlinger speak in Cuvier? I don't know, but they've all got gazelles, so they must be pretty cool. <laughs> of course, other times, the name checks yeah. go to people who had fuck all to do with anything except for one taxonomist being a fan of theirs. Plenty of popular celebrities have species named after them, but since all the big cute stuff was found and branded a while ago, most of these idols are commemorated through repulsive little invertebrates. You got Scaptia, Beyonce, -a. The only similarity I can gather here is Queen Bee. <laughs> that face! <laughs> Looks like a bee, both not a real bee. There's Anomphilus jagarius, an old stone named after an old stone. Wow. In 2007, <laughs> one Jason Bond, a professor of biology at UC Davis, dubbed this little dude Mermechia Fila Neil Youngie to honor his favorite musician, which caused my Neil man Stephen Youngie. Colbert to go on TV and profess his <laughs> utter indignation at not having a spider named after himself. So naturally, the next year, Bond actually went on the Colbert Report <laughs> to announce the naming of Apostatist Stephen Colbert. -y. So, <laughs> if that gives any of you epic biologists out are there any ideas? You know, I wouldn't be opposed. Please, I would do anything. For the love of God, I'll even take a liking. The world of politics is by no means immune to this phenomenon. Obama alone is fucking nine. As do a load of other presidents. Trump's got a moth with funny hair. Bush has a fungus beetle. Reagan's a wasp. Carter's got a darter. And so forth. Even Austria's most famous painter oh, got no, the honor really? through this blind cave beetle. Wow. Mind you, it was 1933, so you can only blame the guy a tiny bit. Hitler actually wrote him a letter saying, Oh, thank you, my little entomalo mensch. And then went on to do, you know, Hitler. <laughs> Things. Fun fact, not only was this beetle stuck with just about the worst name you could have, it's also now facing extinction solely because of its value to Nazi memorabilia cult. That's, that is so crazy how just adding a word or a name can, can cause something, something to go like that. Though things don't always have that case, like I know sales of Corona Light actually went up after COVID, back when we called it coronavirus. 
One thing that still bothers me is the expression going nuclear means you're about to do something crazy, um, unhinged, and possibly hurt a whole bunch of people and everything that stands in your way. Whereas going nuclear should mean, hey, creating a safe, clean, reliable, sustainable energy source for the benefit of all of humankind. Go ahead and give me a like and subscribe and comment if you want to join me on that journey making nuclear. I was going to say making nuclear great again, but I'm not sure I want to want to go there. <laughs> Actors, guess old habits die hard. Oh, fictional characters have their fair share of species under their belt. On the topic of evil beetles, this one's named after Darth Vader because he kind of looks like his helmet, I guess. This was That's actually cool. named by the Excellent. same guy who like did the one. bush one and belongs to the same genus. Hmm. There's also this mite, genus Darth Vaderum, which is a lot more accurate and frightening. In 2012, a single bone wow. from above the eye socket of a hitherto unidentified theropod dinosaur was being studied. And suddenly, under the light of the full moon, the guy working with the specimen had his neck covered with hair and his lips clenched into a pog and his endocrine system filled with Soy, and he said, it's just like the eye of Sauron. What? And then he started chewing on Funko Pops and sweating cream of meme and snorting G Fuel and shitting D20s everywhere until the prostate stimulation made him. The dino's genus is now Sauroniops from- I, I don't know what that- I'm guessing a slide of the sort of people that are- that are into d and I, uh, I never got past the first level when I tried playing d and with some roommates and- College. Of Sauron. This spider was named after Godric Gryffindor because it looks like the sorting hat. SpongeBob has not a sponge, but a fungus. It's terrifying the legendary SpongeBob. birds from Pokemon each have their own. You guessed it, beetle. And the list goes on. <laughs> Scientists are nerds. Who knew? Anyway, while this yes. all seems kind of chaotic, there is some method to the madness. One rule is the principle of priority. This states that once somebody publishes their chosen name for a species for the first time, that's the name, and other taxonomists typically can't change it. This has led to plenty of misnomers coined by whoever got their foot in the door first, particularly in the case of the guys doing this stuff before we had the luxury of mm. genetic analysis. Here's one. Red Panda? Nah. Shining Cat, coined in 1825. To be fair, cool. they're actually about as close to cats as they are to actual pandas, so whatever. Here's two. Capsicum chinense. Eaten there? Sure. Native? Only off by around half a globe where literally all hot peppers came from. This principle holds true even if someone thinks they found a new species only to later discover that it was already named. For example, in 1824, one John Edward Gray documented the plain zebra, calling it Equus burchellii, or Birchell's horse, named hmm. after a renowned naturalist of the day. Little did he know, back in 1785, some other douche classified <laughs> this character as the quagga. The last quagga died in a Dutch prison in 1883. So, why wow. do we care? Well, in the 2000s, scientists decided to scrape some gunk off a dry quagga pelt and study its DNA. And from that, they realized, wait a minute, apparently this guy and zebras could have, you know, made a little plaid in the <laughs> hay together. So technically, they're one species. And today, they're both called quagga. Sounds kind of asinine, but then huh. again, so does asinus, and that worked out fine. Just to maintain the <laughs> distinction, the extinct subspecies was renamed quagga quagga, so you know it's the real quagga. This double naming convention has been done with a lot of subspecies, in fact. Wild Wild Horse, Spotted Spotted Panther, or my favorite, Gorilla Gorilla Gorilla. That's, that's awesome. <laughs> this kind of reminds me of how Buffalo 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 is a complete sentence. I'll link that in the description. <laughs> Yeah, it's the gorillas gorilla that ever gorilla. <laughs> Fuck you want from me. A closely related rule also states that the names of all taxa have to be unique. So if two people coincidentally name any taxa on the same thing, the older one gets to stay and the new one gets the boot. Like if you saw a genus called wow. echidna, you'd think it was, you know, an echidna, right? Well, no, that'd make too much sense. For a while it was true, from 1797 to 1811. Then it was pointed out that someone else already called a genus of moray eels echidna back in 1788. So the real echidna had to be changed to tachyglossus, or quick tongue. Then a decade later, a dude did the same thing for a genus of vipers. Another 22 years passed, people discovered the same thing, and they were renamed to Bitis, cause they Bitis. That one at least made a bit of sense, given that the original echidna from Greek mythology was half lady, half snake, but who cares at this point. That's crazy, I mean, it's just, and yeah, cause in like the 1800s, 1700s, it took a while for these things to be communicated. It wasn't internet back then. It's kinda like, if only we invented the internet before naming animals. <laughs> Oh, that's just, that's just funny. I've just barely scraped the surface of all the goofy names out there, so feel free to post more down below. <laughs> that's all I've got for now. That was crazy. I never knew all those stories behind animals' names. Uh, my favorite is probably still Gorilla Gorilla Gorilla. <laughs> I like the little, the little shout out towards uh, the uh, ionizing radiation names and just a bunch of physicists trying to, trying to show their clout. <laughs>
Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time.